Hi, I'm Tina Hessman Say, the senior writer and molecular biology reporter at Science News Magazine. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the virtual Regeneron ICEF 2020. Our session today is the future of biosciences. So let's get right to it and meet our panelists. We have Dr. Leroy Hood. He is the Senior Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer of Providence St. Joseph Health and co-founder, professor, and Chief Strategic Officer of the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle. He's also competed in the Science Talent Search in 1956. Welcome, Dr. Hood. Pleasure to be here. And we have joining us today, Dr. Huda Zogby. She's the Ralph D. Feigen Professor of Pediatrics, Neurology, Neuroscience, and Molecular and Human Genetics at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. She's an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the founding director of the Jan and Dan Duncan Neurological Research Institute at Texas Children's Hospital. Welcome, Dr. Zogby. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. All right, well, we're going to be talking about the future of biosciences, but just for a minute, I'd like to take you back to the past and ask you both about how you knew when you wanted to become a scientist. Uh, I'll start. Uh, I grew up in a small town in Montana, Shelby, Montana. And I have to say, I think deciding that I wanted to become, become a scientist was a uh, fascinating evolutionary process. My father, an electrical engineer, taught courses which I attended in high school on circuit design and, and, and so forth that profoundly later influenced how I thought about biology. My grandfather actually ran a summer camp for geologists from Princeton, Yale, and Harvard, and Columbia. And there I did my silence talent project that got me uh, back to Washington, DC in 1956. And finally, I was actually teaching a course with my chemistry teacher my senior year and taught about the structure of DNA uh, from Scientific American three years after its structure had been discovered. And, and there I decided biology was the discipline I really wanted to do, and I did want to be a scientist. And what about you, Dr. Zogby? For me, it's a little different. I grew up in Beirut, Lebanon. I really wanted to be a literature major, but my mom recognized that I was good at science and suggested I try medicine, which I did at the American University of Beirut. But during the Civil War, I had to come here for safety reasons with my younger siblings and ended up finishing medical school and starting a residency in pediatrics and then neurology. And it was really an encounter with a patient during my child neurology residency, I saw a child who was healthy and gradually lost all her skills by two years of age and progressed to develop balance problems, autism, constant hand wringing. And serendipitously, I saw another one like her a week later. This is a syndrome that was only discovered and described once in Europe and called Rett syndrome. But having seen the two cases here within a week, and they were all girls based on the literature, I was convinced, although this is a sporadic disorders, I was convinced it had to be genetic. And I decided for me to do something about this devastating disease, I need to go learn how to do science. So I went, after I finished my training in child neurology, went into the lab and learned molecular biology and molecular genetics under Arthur Boudet, and then started my own lab with the goal to find the Rett syndrome gene. And you did. 16 years later, because it was a genetic <laughs> disease. Now you can find it any week with today's technology. This is how exciting things are today. All right. Well, I guess we should move to the future. Um, uh, Dr. Hood, you started the Institute for Systems Biology. Can you talk a little bit about 
what is systems biology and how is that different from regular biology? So systems biology takes a global holistic view of biological problems. And one of the convictions from when I started at Caltech in 1970 is that humans are enormously complicated and you have to generate an enormous amount of information to begin deconvoluting that complexity. So at the Institute for Systems Biology, we started a series of programs in 1914 where we looked initially at 108 uh, individuals and generated billions of data points on each of them, the genome plus uh, many other things in a longitudinal manner. And these data clouds led us to two fundamental insights. One, they identified for each individual unique lists of actionable possibilities which if acted upon could improve health and or avoid disease. And two, the data clouds gave us fundamentally new insights when analyzed into human biology and disease. In, in many ways, they were just like the Hubble telescope. So we have then pushed that further and more recently proposed at Providence Hospital, where I work uh, part-time anyway, uh, that uh, we do this on a million individuals and divide them into well patients and four different classes of disease and do this over a period of five years. And my conviction is in that time, we'll learn as much or more about those diseases and wellness as we have in the last 30 years. Sounds very exciting. And we're gonna follow up on that in a little bit. But uh, Dr. Zogby, first I wanted to ask you, uh, you study both uh, brain disorders that happen early in life and some that happen later in life. What is the connection between things that happen early in life and later in life? Is there one? So at the core of both types of diseases, early childhood diseases or adult degenerative disease, at the core of that is the loss of synaptic connections. Neurons communicate with other neurons through synapses. And when you have developmental disorders, and we now know of hundreds of genes that can cause these childhood developmental disorders, uh, whether autism or intellectual disability, no matter what the function of these proteins are, eventually the synaptic connection between neurons are weaker, and this leads to the symptoms that we see in these disorders. Now, normal development, of course, the key part of normal development, somewhere between two years of age and 10 years of age, that's when a lot of refinement of these synapses is happening. And this is why a child can learn languages much better than an adult, because that's an area where you have lots of synapses and now is the time to prune them and refine them. In adult neurodegenerative disease, what we see, unfortunately, is loss of certain neurons. And one of the earlier marks of the loss of these neurons is the loss of their processes and synaptic connections. So, if you have experienced some damage in early childhood and one may have fewer synapses, sometimes that may make that brain slightly more vulnerable in aging. And some of the proteins that we know can cause or give susceptibility to Alzheimer, we know they are involved in sculpting these synapses. So altogether, it really comes down to this very key point of contact between neurons that's important for transmission of information. Yeah. So, I mean, you're both coming at information from a little bit different perspective. Um, and, but you have both made some fundamental discoveries in genetics. And I wanted to ask you about all of the DNA sequence that we have right now. Um, is the human genome sequence going to be as important in the future as it has been for the last two decades? Or do you see us sort of moving beyond the, the genome into other areas that might tell us more about our own biology? 
So I see uh, the answer is uh, clearly both. Right now, with regard to the genome, we understand maybe a tenth of a percent of the information and things it does it can do. We understand very little about the enormous variability and how, to, how it changes phenotype. So there is an enormous opportunity understanding an individual's genome to have a sense of what they're going to develop and become, but we're just beginning that understanding. What is critical is to be able to look at the consequences of lifestyle and environment to that genetic information. And this is where we have to make measurements of uh, uh, blood analytes and the gut microbiome that is determining the ratio of, of uh, species present in your gut, uh, digital analyses of self and so forth. And these data, when integrated together with the genome data, give us enormous fundamental new insights. For example, we looked recently at a population of 5,000 where we could use a type of analysis called polygenic scores or genome-wide association scores to, for each individual, assign a risk for 54 different diseases. And what we found in looking at two of those diseases very carefully was if you're at high risk for a disease and you're already beginning to manifest itself, you need drugs and not lifestyle to make that change for, say, LDL cholesterol. Whereas if you're low risk and have high LDL cholesterol, exercise and diets and so forth can have a remarkable change. So the idea is, if you're at a high risk for a genetic disease, we're going to, in the future, treat you quite differently than if you're at a low risk. And the high risk, actually, in really interesting ways in terms of blood analytes, presuages the kind of thing that's going to happen when you actually transition into that disease. And it brings up the really interesting point can we correct these high-risk individuals before they ever trans transition into disease? And my feeling is that will be the preventive, one aspect of preventive medicine in the 21st century. Great. What about you, Dr. Sogby? Do you, I, you see I, it moving that direction as well? Absolutely. I actually see it. We're just at the beginning. We just saw the tip of the iceberg. So what do we know today is we've identified the gene that causes what I would call the severe form of diseases, if you will. The syndromic form. Red syndrome is a syndromic form of autism. It's autism plus seizures plus motor problems, etc. Fragile X, etc all these things, they're now the milder forms of autism. That's just the social behavioral problem and language problems we need to discover. We discovered the Mendelian form, if you will, of Alzheimer, the gene that causes early onset of Alzheimer, but those only make 5% of all Alzheimer. You've got 95% of the rest of the population who gets Alzheimer that either have a much milder mutation that in some people, it might cause Alzheimer, but in others, it might not. Why? What is the factor? Is what Dr. Hood mentioned, the environment. What other health conditions they might have. So what's our challenge right now is to really use the genome as we study individual to find who might have these milder form of mutations or variants that may even exist in the population, but based on your experiences, environmental exposure, and other things might make you vulnerable. And we need not just genome, not just the human genome, we need genomes because we're finding variants in a human with a particular mild disorder where you don't know if this is the variant causing their disease. You don't know what that one change in the DNA is doing to the function of the gene. But sometimes if we take that one change and put it in fruit flies or in mice, and we see it is indeed consequential, then we know it's causing a functional effect. It's perturbing the function of the gene. So I think that there's a huge opportunity to now take what we've learned 
from the straightforward Mendelian diseases that cause severe disease and look now at their milder forms, if you will, or the partial loss of function forms, and study that both in the context of different individuals, different species to really understand those functional changes, as well as in the context of gene environment interaction. Right, and Dr. Hood, you mentioned also the, the microbiome. Um, are those some of the genomes that you think are going to be important as well to sequence, Dr. Zagri? Well, I think in, in medicine, the microbiome is going to be extremely important. I think we're at the very, very beginning of that. The most convincing demonstration is there's a very bad intestinal infection that essentially can only be effectively cured doing microbiome transplant from a healthy person to the diseased person. A really striking effect. We've been able to demonstrate that we can look at blood metabolites and we can estimate from that the extent and nature of the diversity in the gut microbiome. And it's just given that the more diverse your microbiome is, the healthier you're going to be. So we're just beginning to see, it's clear the microbiome makes some really critical chemicals like some of the brain neurotransmitters that are absolutely essential for the organism. So the interrelationships between our cells are a fascinating area for exploration in the future. And when you talk about the microbiome, you're talking about the bacteria that live in your intestines? Yes, the microbiome is essentially the, an assessment of the population of bacteria that live in your GI tract. And these bacteria actually take in food, metabolize it in interesting ways. They can actually, from your food, generate chemicals for some that can be toxic. They can do a wide variety of different kinds of things. And clearly, when you take broad-spectrum antibiotics, you, uh, you really cut down the microbiome population in striking ways. And that's one good reason why broad-spectrum antibiotics ought to be restricted in their use to uh, severe infectious cases and so forth. But again, uh, I mean, it's just interesting to think that there are... Uh, millions of organisms living inside you that have a big influence in how healthy you are. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Zogby, are, are those some of the, uh, the actually, <laughs> genomes you were talking about, or were you I talking was, about other genomes? I was talking about other genomes, but those are, of course, very important. But to do functional studies, I'm talking about the mouse genome, the zebrafish genome, the fruit fly genome, the worm genome, where we're, these many important genes are conserved. And if you have a change in human gene, but you're not sure if this change in the DNA is what's causing the disease, you can go back to the fruit fly and make that change in the equivalent gene in the fruit fly. And immediately the fruit fly will have a symptom or a phenotype, and you'll know this is detrimental, and you can go back and forth. Uh, a study funded by the NIH called the Undiagnosed Disease Network, a whole group of collaborators across the country, rely on these model organism screening to pinpoint variants in the humans to see which of those are functionally important. Well, we've talked a lot about genetics here, but are there other areas of biological sciences that you feel like have been not very well explored and that would be really right for students like our ICEF students to explore in the future? So I think there are an enormous uh, range of possibilities that are exciting opportunities. I'll, I'll talk about one that we're at the very beginning of learning, and that's the process of aging. What we discovered when we looked over a four-year period at 5,000 people uh, analyzing blood analytes, proteins, uh, uh, metabolites, clinical chemistries, and so forth, is that we had a broad spectrum of individuals from 20 to 90 plus 
and that we could bin them in 10 year categories. And from those analytes, we could derive an algorithm that let us determine each individual's biological age. So the biological age is the age your body says you are, as opposed to the age your birthday says you are. And ideally, your biological age should be much younger than your chronologic age if you're aging in a healthy fashion. And we've looked at more than 40 diseases now and shown in all cases, individuals with those diseases, biological age is significantly higher than their chronologic age. And we've been able to demonstrate either for really healthy people who get started on this kind of program, if they do things that improve their diet and their exercise and uh, their environment, you can take a healthy person and actually decrease their biological age in significant ways. What is interesting about the biological age calculation is it reveals metabolites that cause you to age inappropriately from ideal. So it's the calculation we do to determine your biological age gives us deep insights into the kind of things that you could change to improve your biological age. And this, of course, is really exciting because what we've done is we've analyzed individual organ with regard to their biological age. And for each of the major organs, you can calculate a biological age for that. So we can give you a global biological age where we've assessed hundreds of biological systems to get the average. Or we can look at what's specific to the liver, the kidney, or the heart, or uh, the lungs, or whatever. And I think this means in the future for each individual, you can determine your biological age and you can optimize your aging so that you will be able to go into your 90s or later uh, physically capable uh, uh, and mentally alert and so forth. So the whole process of aging, we're just beginning to discover its intrinsic elements and it's just waiting for really bright people to dig in and figure out what is what? What are the mechanisms of aging? Terrific. And uh, Dr. Zogby, I mean, one of those organs is the brain where you've done a lot of your research. Um, are there unexplored areas of brain science that you think are ripe or, or are there other, other biological sciences? That I think that, see? of course, physiology, metabolism, as we've heard, uh, you know, from Dr. Hood, but I think that I will highlight just a couple of areas. I think understanding the brain and its connectivity is a big challenge. We don't know, we don't understand all of the cell types yet in the brain. We don't understand all the different connectivity of these cell types. And until we understand that, and then the functions and the peptides they make and the effect on behavior, all of that is really important. Regeneration, how can we regenerate those cells? Development, how can they develop? Can we mimic that development and allow for the regeneration? There are whole fields to explore. And the more we understand their connectivity and understand which nodes in the brain are important to create a whole circuit to mediate a behavior, the more we understand that, the more we can have therapeutics that can bypass that, just as, you know, Google Maps helps you with traffic. When there is one congested highway, it tells you another way to get there. And the brain is gonna be the same way. The more we understand the circuits, we'll co-opt other circuits to make up for lost function. Of course, all of that requires what great computational biology. So it's another area that I think we're gonna see now synergize with actual biology to help us understand whether it's genomes, metabolites, connectivity, to really solve all these puzzling problems. This is a big area in biology. And I think understanding development at the cellular level, how every cell develops and differentiates, is gonna be critical for us to help regeneration down the line. So there are beautiful areas in biology we can think about, but these are just a few examples. 
Yeah. Well, uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is whether or not you can actually do anything about these genetic brain diseases like the ones that you study. Can you actually someday perhaps cure something like Rett syndrome? Absolutely. The, the beauty of having the genes, you can model the disorder in mice and we get all the symptoms of Rett syndrome in the mice. We also learn if you have the gene in an extra copy, you get another neurological disease, both in mice and humans. So if you have that, you can now test therapeutics. And some examples of therapeutics you can use will be DNA-based, such as antisense oligonucleotides if you're in a lower a gene or a gene replacement therapy. The antisense oligonucleotide we already know are successful in treating neurological diseases. There is a disease called spinal muscular atrophy where the motor neurons are lost and the babies can't walk and they become extremely weak. And it's a small defect in the DNA where if you can use an antisense oligonucleotide that binds the RNA that's being made, you can actually correct that and these children are now healthier. The same thing we're now testing in, in patients with a duplication where the antisense will help normalize a protein and hopefully gene therapy for red. But you can also use network modulation. I was mentioning brain circuits. We now know that if you stimulate certain circuits in the brain, you can actually improve the ability to think, the ability to remember. These are all emerging therapies have been tried successfully in adults, and I can imagine seeing them in children down the line. Right. Well, we've come to the end of our time, but I want to get in one more question, and that is, what is your best advice for our ISEF participants who are starting their careers in science? I, I would say, I think a career in science demands that you take on really hard and problems that are of interest to you. I think it requires that you work with the very best people you possibly can uh, and go to the best schools you can where you'll you'll get good deep learning and the uh, fundamentals. I think it requires a, a determined optimism because when you take on hard problems, you often face many skeptics and you have to be able to push your ideas forward uh, often in the face of skepticism, and I think that's an important learning process in science. I think one thing that is really important in science is that you think about changing in a reasonable way careers every 10 to 15 years. The ordinary success rate for an individual career looks like a bell-shaped curve. And my argument is if you get up near the top of that curve and start a new endeavor where you're uncertain, excited, you're learning, you another bell-shaped curve you can put on top of it. And I've changed <laughs> careers many times throughout my 60 years in science. And every time I've changed, it's been exciting and it's opened up new horizons and it's brought whole new dimension to what it means to be science. So, and I think in the end, the really key thing is it should be fun. Science is so exciting because you can discover new things. And if you have a passion for doing it, you should be honest, but your moral compass should always be, I will do things that are fun. What about you, Dr. Zogby? What do you advise them? I think the first thing I would tell them, they're so lucky to be thinking about getting into science now. Because I think with all the available new knowledge we have, whether it's genomes, technology, all the things available, the marriage between math, science, engineering, all of that is beautiful medicine. So it's a great time to get into science. The one big advice I have, go deep. Because the deeper you look, the more scholarly you are, the more thorough you are, the more you're going to make discoveries. 
there are so many things to be discovered, but you only discover them if you dig deep. The second advice I would say, it is true what we've heard. It, there will be challenges, there will be failures, but science is a lot more fun if you collaborate. So the more you collaborate and the more you share, the more likely you are to make discoveries and enjoy the ride quite a bit along the way. Uh, be generous, share the information, you'll have a very rewarding career. Great, well that's all very great advice. And on behalf of the entire Regeneron ISEF community, I wanna thank you both for your expertise your support of students, and for taking the time to talk with us today. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much.